Innovation on the Edge with Microsoft Edge is a weekly podcast that explores the cutting edge of internet innovation and pop culture trends. Each week, we'll dig into how people are currently using the web to innovate, notable ways in which it's evolving, what its future might look like, and how we can create that future together. Welcome, curious creators, disruptors, and innovators to Innovation on the Edge. I'm your host, Jordan Harbinger, and today I'm talking with Alex Gladstein. Alex, thanks for joining us. So happy to be here, Jordan. Tell us what you do in just a few sentences here, because I think a lot of people are, are expecting uh, when, when we hear human rights, we think, mm -hmm. OK, some guy who sits in the U.N. and, you know, <laughs> once every five years goes and takes a helicopter somewhere and takes a bunch of photos and then goes back to New York. That's yeah, I mean, look, we work I work for the Human Rights Foundation. I've been there since 2007. We're a nonprofit based in New York. We are created by people who grew up under authoritarian regimes. Our founder is Venezuelan. Our chairman is Gary Kasparov from Russia. Our mm -hmm. board is stacked with people from places like North Korea, uh, Chad, um, and elsewhere. So, you know, we have a particular perspective that tyranny and authoritarianism and dictatorship is sort of like the largest challenge that the world is facing. But 4.3 billion people live under an authoritarian regime around the world today. They don't have free speech, free press, independent courts. They don't have the ability to create a uh, a human rights organization to push back against the government. Uh, they lack a lot of the mechanisms that we have in open societies for holding our government accountable. Gary's been, uh, Gary Kasparov has been on my other show, so I'm familiar with some of his work there. But I think that it's hard to, and correct me where I'm wrong, you're the expert, it's hard to sort of overstate how many, first of all, that's a massive number of people. Is that the majority of people on Earth? I lose 50. track of the global population. Yes. Okay, so 53% like of the world's population. And, and you can be glass half full and you can say, hey, you know, a few hundred years ago, no one really lived under a full democracy. You know, minorities and women didn't vote even in democracies. So you, you, you can say that we've actually achieved a lot. But it's important to remember that, again, billions of people live under authoritarianism. Um, and, you know, that's ultimately why technology is so important um because in open societies again we can we can lobby and we can push mm -hmm. our government to protect our rights we have a bill of rights in the united states and we have a supreme court and we have a free press and those things help protect us from politicians gaining too much power right those mechanisms don't exist elsewhere so those people cannot have a world where they discourage their government from doing bad things like so what can they do to protect themselves? Well, one thing that's emerged over the last few, few decades is, is, is technology, and they can be empowered by technology that the government can't stop. And, you know, a lot of listeners may be familiar with the history of cryptography, but I, I wanted to shed some light on it because I think it's an important idea here. In the 1980s, many people realized what was going to happen with regard to governments and corporations getting a lot of power through being able to sift through all this new data that we were giving them. There was a book written in the 1980s called, I think, The Rise of the Computer State. And a New York Times journalist wrote this book and warned people that basically of what, what, what would then later transpire, that, that, that these entities, these authorities would gain huge amounts of control over us because of all this data that they would you know, collect uh, that would tell them about our behavior, right? So his, his conclusion, though, was that we need to, as democratic citizens, like lobby and like fight for our rights. Um, so, and that's true, we should do that. Um, but a small group of activists realized that that was not going to be an option for everyone in this world. And they didn't even trust democratic governments. And these were the cypherpunks, right? So the cypherpunks were the ones who took cryptography uh, and the academic science behind cryptography, which was really pioneered in the late 1970s by Whitfield, Diffie, and Hellman, right, at Stanford University. And they, they turned that into like a user tool, right? So Phil Zimmerman in the early 90s launched PGP. It enabled anyone with a PC to send a private message to someone else with a PC. This is like a, a dramatic revolution in terms of usability for people, right? At the time, the Clinton administration did not like this. Joe Biden did not like this. <laughs> so there was like people in power that were considered progressive, right? Long right. sort of left or Democrat. They, they really, really didn't like the idea of Americans being able to trade secret messages. So they went after Phil Zimmerman. Companies went after Phil Zimmerman because he was sharing his code for free and they wanted to, they had patents on it or they wanted to control it, right? 
Um, and the government went after him and they tried to like sort of get him in trouble for like exporting weapons, essentially, because cryptography was considered a weapon at the time. Um, thankfully, this all fell apart. They were unable to stop open source code. Their plan to put clipper chips in consumer devices, which would give back doors to the government into encrypted messaging, failed. Um, and, you know, today we reap the benefits of that. Of, of that. Uh, at the time, the Clinton administration was saying that this was just going to be for criminals and pedophiles and terrorists, this idea of privacy, okay? What, thankfully, they were wrong, <laughs> and they continue to be wrong today. You know, this idea of, like, encrypting information led to the rise of e-commerce and led to the rise of Silicon Valley and so many other incredible things that, that have powered our nation forward, right? And have allowed us today in 2021 to be able to use something like Signal, which tens of millions in Ameri of Americans use, to be able to trade messages with each other in a way that the NSA cannot see, no matter how hard they try or how much they care. They can see the metadata, but they cannot see what's inside the message, right? So, and this is so important for, again, people around the world. Uh, in America, again, maybe we can fight for our rights and, and retain our privacy and prevent the government from doing certain things. But again, not an option for billions of people around the world. And this is what has animated our work at the Human Rights Foundation. We're looking at how can technology fight back where politics doesn't work. Okay, so in North Korea, there's like mass censorship. So we have a program where we send in flash drives of information um, over the Chinese border into the markets where people buy and sell these uh, USB keys or SD cards or smartphones packed with information from the outside world, movies, books, um, dramas, songs, and this helps them expand their minds. We had a similar program in Cuba where we helped get movies and books into the underground library movement uh, in around 2006, 7, and 8 before internet had really penetrated Cuba that allowed people to share inside their homes um, provocative works that had been banned, right? So we saw how technology you know, about 15 years ago was, was changing the world in this way. Uh, and then that has just continued. We've seen the activist movement around the world in adopt encrypted messaging. And, and, and in my personal time running this Oslo Freedom Forum conference, uh, which maybe some people have heard of, you know, when we started it in 2009, no activists were encrypting their messages. Like that, this didn't really, this was not a popular idea. By 2019, I would say 95% of them are, are, are using some sort of encryption so, or, or, and using VPNs. And that this technology has sunk in and people have realized its value. So, you know, from a human rights perspective, tech is critical. Yes, it can be used to oppress us. Yes, the Chinese government is, is building this awe-inspiring surveillance state using artificial intelligence and big data analysis. But we have to remember it also gives people a tool to fight back. That's interesting how it's kind of a double-edged double, a double sword is probably not exactly the word I'm looking for, but the same technology that can be used or similar technology that can be used to look at everything that we're doing can also be some of the same types of technology that we can use to sort of hide our actions. I vaguely remember uh, – or I should say protect our actions. Mm -hmm. um, I vaguely remember when – was it RIM for BlackBerry was in Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia? And they basically said, listen, you've got to give us a backdoor or you can't do business here. And I want to say they caved, but I can't remember. That's the problem with closed source code and corporate technology. They can build backdoors. So this is why open source code is a massive uh, part of the human rights movement globally and why projects uh, like Tor and like Signal uh, are so important for helping people browse the web and helping people communicate. And in the last five years, I've really added a, a third area to my interest in, in, the, in the context of open source code, and that's money. And I, I think that Bitcoin is the open source money project that deserves to be discussed alongside projects like Signal and Tor that, that is this incredible human rights tool for people. I would argue that it's even more important than the others. Um, in the last five years at the Human Rights Foundation, we've researched how people who are stuck under authoritarian regimes... Remember, these 4.3 billion people often face arbitrary freezing of their bank accounts, economic mm -hmm. isolation due to the fact that their rulers are evil and often do like terrible things so that the U.S. government will often sanction the entire country. And then right. all the people, regardless of whether they even care about their leaders, they didn't even elect them, of course, it's a dictatorship, right. but they get punished by the actions of their leaders, right? So you have people who've got frozen bank accounts who are shut off from the outside world in an innocent, they didn't do anything wrong. Um, and, and they also suffer from like massive economic mismanagement, right? So in addition to the 4.3 billion who live under this sort of tyrannical r rule, um, you have 1.2 billion people who live under double or triple digit inflation. So these are people who are watching their wages and earnings disappear in a fairly quick amount of time. 
and we're talking big countries here, Nigeria, uh, 200 million people, 100 million people in Ethiopia, 100 million people in, you know, Philippines, Turkey, 40, 40 or 50 million people in Argentina. You know, all of these people are suffering from like, over the last few decades, tremendous amounts of inflation. And, and not the kind of like, not, not like 2% like we have in America, like right, massive, amount, say, tell, of, tell massive us, amount of massive amount of inflation. Our, so, so like 2% means what my money essentially is worth half, but it takes like 30 years yeah. or 25 years, or I can't remember the exact time frame well, for this. Well, the, the, the 2% inflation is based on a certain basket of goods when, when Canadians or Americans look at inflation. Mm-hmm. There's also asset inflation. So like obviously, every as every American knows, things like um, real estate uh, and, and gold and other things have gotten a lot more expensive in the last few decades. There's also like, services inflation so like things like healthcare and um uh education have gotten a lot more expensive uh than than just this two percent a year number but the point is like we have we our inflation even if it's worse than most people realize um or or worse than the real numbers pales in comparison to what people have to deal with in ethiopia which is 20 percent inflation or in sudan where there's 340 percent inflation or venezuela where there's 4,000 percent inflation so, you know, Bitcoin is like this weapon or, you know, really a defensive technology, kind of like encryption. I shouldn't say weapon. It's a peaceful technology mm-hmm. um, because it's a shield that you can use to protect yourself from uh, the, the twin kind of harms of both like debasement and, you know, high inflation, which essentially steals, you know, your value, mm-hmm. your time and energy that you're putting into this currency. Um, and it also protects you against like, censorship and freezing of your funds and deplatforming and stuff like that. So to me, it's a really powerful freedom tool that people in uh, all over the world, but especially in emerging markets are like increasingly adopting and they're opting out of the very restrictive broken financial system that they're, that they're like, that they've been brought up under and they're opting into a new parallel financial system. I remember when I had moved for a short time to Ukraine in 2001 or 2002 and I remember going there and thinking like, all right, I'm just going to bring my credit cards because I don't need to like create a bank account. I'm only going to be here for three months. But there were missionaries and other people like that that were moving there that were in my language program. And I remember one guy brought over a – and I'm not even kidding. He brought over like a coffee can that had 40000 U.S. dollars in it in cash or a couple coffee cans that mm-hmm. had that. He flew with that money. And brought it in, and I thought, <laughs> are you insane? You know, what are you doing? Why would you do And he goes, you know what? Um, the reason we do this is because our other church leader or whoever he was – because he, he was meeting an organization that was working there. He said they would wire us $20,000, and they'd go, it's at the bank right now. And we would walk in, and the manager would go, you don't have any money here. And there's right. nothing you can do because the, the someone in the government went – I'm going to take that. This doesn't look like it belongs to anybody who's important. It's not a diplomat. I'm just going to take that. Get, give me that money. It's all a matter of trust. I mean, both in the humanitarian and in the human rights context, we have this issue of trust where, like, if you have someone who wants to donate to your cause, uh, let's say you're a journalist organization in Russia, which I will mention in a second because that's timely. Uh, or let's say you're like a, uh, an agricultural uh, community in Kenya and someone in Washington wants to give you money. In both cases, you have to go through all these third parties along the way. There's no like previous to Bitcoin, there was no like real peer to peer digital way to send money across time and, and space. I mean, it was it was hard to do. Uh, it was something that relied on trusting other parties who take a fee, they can freeze it, they can confiscate it. And, and this is a bigger problem than people think. I mean, in the humanitarian space, some massive amount of like money that's donated gets sucked up by middlemen before it gets to the people who you want to help. Some mm-hmm. massive amount. I mean, the U.S. government did a study a few years ago on this. Uh, some of their programs in West Africa, the people who were supposed to be benefiting were getting like less than 10% of the money donated. I mean, so we're talking about enormous waste. And this is well known. I mean, the U.N. talks about this. When Ban Ki-moon was secretary general, he was talking about how wasteful the humanitarian sector is. It's like pouring water into a bucket with holes in it. Like, you know, mm-hmm. th- this is this is well known. Um, what maybe not is talked about enough is like the human rights side where, again, donations are blocked, frozen. Uh, organizations in Hong Kong like that were supporting the protesters were having their bank accounts frozen. Uh, the Feminist Coalition, which was helping um, the protest movement in Nigeria, had its had its bank account shut down. The Belarusians who are trying to peacefully overthrow their dictator, they've had their stuff shut down. 
you know, maybe and maybe some Americans are aware of Operation Choke Point, and maybe they're aware of some of the stuff that's happened in our in in my country where we have had some of these things happen, and maybe they are aware of the Bank Secrecy Act and all of this financial surveillance. So maybe they're aware, but if they're not, if they're like living in a blasé way, uh, in, in a in a very um, comfort com- comfortable way, mm-hmm. they may not know about the severe financial repression that happens around the world. And this is where Bitcoin is just is similarly, it helps us get out of the system. So in the same way that encrypted messaging helps us get out of that system that Snowden revealed in terms of the way that governments were spying on their people, Bitcoin helps you get out of that system where governments and corporations are, are controlling, you know, not just money, but, but they're learning and they're building these cloud surveillance systems based on your financial transactions. We talk about surveillance capitalism. Surveillance mm-hmm. capitalism only works because these companies, when you make a swipe, they vacuum up a huge amount of information about your last transaction, your next transaction, your home address, your preferences. I mean, when you gave a dollar bill or a $20 bill to buy something at a newsstand or a hardware store, that person doesn't know your name or anything about you. And that was right. fine. That was like morally fine. And that's what we should act to, to try and keep alive in the digital age. Because we're not going to have paper money in the future. It's all no. going away. We're having this war on cash. I mean, kids born today won't ever touch paper money. It'll be just like a relic. So how do we keep that privacy going? And that's why Bitcoin's so important. And to give you a timely story, yesterday, Vladimir Putin's regime in Russia froze the bank account of a very important independent journalist organization called Medusa. Um, so now they are accepting Bitcoin donations and Bitcoin will help them keep going. Another really good example that may be very familiar to people who are listening to this is Sci-Hub. Have you, have you ever seen, do you know the story of Sci-Hub? No, no, I never even heard of this. So you know how like academic and scientific papers are absurdly expensive and pay paywalled behind these uh, like, like mega, mega corporations, exactly. Kind of thing. Yeah. So mm-hmm. this is like very unfair. Um, a lot of people view this as very unfair. They think information should be free, right? They think information should be liberated. So there's a Kazakh, a woman in Kazakhstan, uh, and she runs this website called SciHub, and you can look at any of these articles for free using SciHub. And of course, a lot of corporate interests want to take her down. So she's managed to like stay alive and stay up. And she accepts money in Bitcoin because obviously payment providers connected to corporate and government interests, uh, you know, won't refuse to service her. So, you know, these people who are taking risks to help others, uh, for a lot of them around the world, Bitcoin is, 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 is their only option. And, and I think that's why it's important for us to discuss. So, so essentially, with Sci-Hub, she's and I'm putting this in air quotes. She's stealing because that's how the it, this sure. is like bit. This is like BitTorrent, where I may or may not have gotten a few movies back in college. Not never doing that now, of course. But I, you know, these are the, like she will go and get a paper and put it up. One there. man's thief is another man's liberator. It all depends on your perspective. Yeah. But if you sure. believe that science should be free and open for students around the world and that they shouldn't have to pay extortionate sums to access these papers that are important for their learning, then mm-hmm. this woman's a hero. If you work for JSTOR and you know she is hurting your business, then she's a villain. It all depends on your perspective, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Especially th- there's a whole argument here about who funds the science and how come I can't look at it if this is a study done with my tax dollars? Why is it on JSTOR and I have to now buy it for $600? Like, um, and there's like different levels of subscription. And I mean, right. at, at the end of the day, that's a, that's just an example. I mean, there's so many more. I mean, again, the Belarusian movement, uh, and I, I think many many people may be listening to this. There are a lot of really brilliant uh, people of Belarusian descent who live in Silicon Valley, and they've been supporting our cause where at the Human Rights Foundation, we've been donating money to groups like BISOL or Mediasol, who are helping pay legal bills, helping get support for Belarusians who are striking against the government peacefully, uh, women's rights organizations. And guess what? Like that money gets into Belarus by Bitcoin. It doesn't get in by bank wire because the government controls the financial system. But in this way, these groups who are, who are in continental Europe that we're supporting, they, they send in the Bitcoin in a peer-to-peer way to individuals, okay, on their phone, who, who they, you know, they pick up their phone, and they, on their phone, all of a sudden, in minutes, they receive the Bitcoin and they like have control over the Bitcoin, okay? And then from their phone, they can then sell the Bitcoin when they need to into rubles. And what's happening in the background is that a trader, uh, a, you know, a money market person from mm-hmm. Ukraine or Russia is like buy- very happily buying the Bitcoin from that person right. and then, and then get, giving them these like increasingly worthless rubles. But hey, that, and then they wire that small amount to that person's bank account. And they can then go buy 
groceries or whatever. But the point is the regime, you know, all they're seeing is like all these like disconnected small amounts coming in. They don't know what's going on. They can't like match it up and pair it. Um, but if they do see like a $30,000 bank wire come in to a person, yeah, they're going to freeze cut it that immediately right in, in the story you just gave. Right. So the fact that we've been able to design a system where governments cannot stop the flow of money is tremendously important for humans. Um, and, and I just think it's something that the technology world needs to think more closely about. Right. So in order to stop the Belarusian flow of Bitcoin to rubles, et cetera, they would literally have to say no money transfers at all in the whole country, which is effective. They'd have to kind of turn the lights out in the whole place, which even a, even a, even a dictator can't really afford to do that uh, to his. Yeah. Population. I mean, to stop encryption, you know, or to stop Bitcoin, you have to turn the Internet off. Um, yeah. And there's there's even ways around that. I mean, there's a there's something called Blockstream Satellite. So this is, of course, for the hobbyist among us. But mm -hmm. but this tech continues to get cheaper. You can you can send and receive Bitcoin over satellite, so you don't have to worry about any you, any dependence on any sort of government telecom communications infrastructure. And that stuff's just continuing to um, to expand around the world. And if you think about it, I mean. Again, using Bitcoin usually is just you're just holding on to it between transactions. So if the Internet goes down, nothing happens. Like, you know, you know, the, the way that a Bitcoin transaction works is basically use like a signing device to sign a transaction. And then it gets put into a queue where it waits in this global mempool. And then miners scoop up the transactions that are waiting and they they mine them. And the miner who gets who wins this sort of global race uh, gets rewarded for providing that service to the network, and then we move on to the next block. But that process, you know, if the internet goes down in a particular country, that process keeps going. First of all, mm -hmm. like you'd have to shut down every single every single country in the world's internet, right, um, for, to stop this process of transacting and processing Bitcoin transactions. But again, if you're just someone who bought some Bitcoin and you're saving it, and you're in Ethiopia, and this is how you're like saving because your local currency is terrible. The internet going out does nothing and it's completely irrelevant to you. Like this is this is just not relevant. I mean your 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 coins are staying where they are, you know? So I, I think that, you know, a lot of these conversations are nuanced, but let's just put it this way. There's not a lot of technical risks to, to this network. It's extremely robust. Um, in the same way that a lot of open source software projects are very robust. And it's interesting that you know, a lot of companies like Microsoft are have the, having this renewed commitment to open source, which is really cool. So I think at the end of the day, over the next decade, as more and more people realize the value of stuff like encrypted messaging and, and Bitcoin, you're going to see you're going to see a lot more uh, corporate support, which is cool. Um, and like cryptocurrency exchanges have donated a lot of money to, de to open source developers working to strengthen Bitcoin. And we're doing that, too, at the Human Rights Foundation. We hope we can encourage others to do the same. What are you working on with Bitcoin and the Human Rights Foundation? Yeah, so we kind of have a like a I'd say three a three pronged approach. We have a kind of advocacy approach where we're like running workshops and teaching activists how to use this thing if they need it. It's an important tool. We want them to know how to use it if they need it. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's incredibly powerful, and we want them to know how to use it safely and securely. So a lot of that stuff is done off the record, but you know, those are ongoing with us. Okay, we also have some like educational content you know we write a lot about this we speak a lot about this and we just try to raise the you know raise the profile of this idea of bitcoin and human rights being connected and we do that in front of many many thousands of people every month i mean constantly on different podcasts like this one and and you know we have this educational activist component um and then we we also have um a uh, a component regarding the develop the software itself so we have a Bitcoin development fund. It's like hf.org slash dev fund. And, you know, people donate to that. And then from there, we choose uh, grantees who are working to help the Bitcoin network become more private and, and secure. And, and these are people building wallets, building phone apps, working on the core protocol itself. Um, so that's something else we're doing. And then the third area would be like research. So we have advocacy, we have software development, and then we have research. So in the research side, what we're trying to do is learn about the adoption globally in authoritarian regimes and emerging markets. How how and why are people using Bitcoin? So this is being done in like an ongoing series of interviews, but also we have some other stuff coming up that, that we'd like to do more in terms of like ethnographic surveys of users. But I mean, look, you've got 10 million Bitcoin users in India. You've got 
probably close to 5 million in Nigeria. You've got several million in places like Argentina. You've got 10 million in the United States. So, I mean, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, the, cl- today, uh, best estimates are about 200 million users uh, of, uh, of Bitcoin. That's it? It seems so much bigger because I'm online and I'm just surrounded yeah, I mean, on, by it. On the one hand, you're like, okay, that's only about 2.5% of the world's population. And a right. lot of those people maybe used it, you know, they're not like... When they, when we say users, I mean they may have bought Bitcoin four years ago, and that's it, and it's just sort of sitting there. And that, but that's using Bitcoin. I mean, that's yeah. really that is. I mean, They're, the primary use case globally is savings, saving in Bitcoin, and maybe you want to call that. Yeah, maybe people want to call it investment or speculation or hoarding or whatever they want to call it. I mean, it depends sure. on you know whether you like it or not. You're going to use a different word, but basically, like either earning it or mining it or or exchanging your fiat money for it and then just holding it is the world's largest use case for this thing right now. Um, it's a store of value. It's an inflation hedge for many, right? But it's also like a medium of exchange and a payment rail. So a lot of folks use it for remittances. Uh, the remittance market is extremely extortionate, and this allows what, what again, is, this peer-to-peer. What is remittances for those who don't know? Sure. So a remittance would be like, let's say you live in the Philippines and you want to support your family, so you go and work in Korea or in the Gulf and, and you earn income there and you send the, and you send the money back. So for a lot of countries like the Philippines or Nigeria, a huge percentage of, of the GDP is, is done by remittances by workers abroad. Mm-hmm. So this idea of like the remitters being able to just have that peer to peer relationship with their family. And then, you know, the, the money goes through in minutes, uh, or even in seconds with something called lightning network. And, and we're getting there, we're building Bitcoin in a way that's more usable, more private, more fast, more scalable, uh, with almost no, you know, lightning network has like no f- energy footprint, essentially. It's like not ha- it, there's nothing happening on the main blockchain, but using these tools, folks can send money to their family or friends or colleagues or whatever within minutes, essentially. Um, and then they, and then they keep that as like their kind of like savings account. And then when they need to cash it out into fiat, uh, whether it's pesos or lira or whatever, they go to a local marketplace on their, you know, they don't go physically. They, they use their phone to tap into a local marketplace. They go to a telegram group or they, they find their local marketplace. And these are now active in like every urban area on earth. And they exchange that small, whatever they want to cash out uh, in, into local currency. And then they use it from there. Um, but essentially what you're seeing is this rise of it being kind of like the savings account that people have. Um, and, then, and then they chop off pieces of it into local fiat currency to do stuff. This is kind of where we are with with tech uh, globally right now. I got a taste of the remittance process when I was – I want to say I was living in Mexico and my credit card stopped working. I was like, hey, Uh uh, just wire me some money. And my parents were like, all right, how's the best way to do this? (laughs) And then we ended up using like – it's not Western Union. We were using some sort of other version of it, and I remember going – did I just pay thirty dollars to get four hundred dollars? Like, how dare you? You know, this is. Yeah. Like, I'm in college. I'm not exactly a high earner, and I just remember thinking, "This is ridiculous." If I'm earning ten bucks an hour, I just spent three hours out of my forty-hour work week just b- wasting it, giving it to a guy at a drugstore because he did he entered something in a database. It was just well, insulting. And, and I will say that, like, you're correct. And again, uh, the remittance market is extortionate. And some people may say, "Well, Bitcoin's expensive too." And the, the correct response to that is, um, yes, if you, if you like, there's something called a fee market in Bitcoin. So like essentially to encourage a miner to include your transaction in, in the block that they're working on, that they're going to submit to the network that's eventually going to go into the blockchain, um, you need to attach a fee. That fee uh, can be different sizes, right? So if you just do the default, like, and, and you, and you want to have your transaction go through right away, yeah, it, right now that could range from anywhere from five dollars to ten dollars, and even during really intense periods of um, of network activity, up to twenty or thirty dollars. And I think that's going to go higher. But if you're willing to be patient, and it's like a one time thing that you do once a week or something like that, you can wait, and and you can mm-hmm. wait till the you know weekends or night times, and and it's way less than a dollar. Like you know, if, if you're willing to wait. What's really exciting, though, is that, again, this idea of lightning. Um, so there's this company called Strike, for example, that, that relies on the lightning network, which is like a scaling technology that goes on top of the Bitcoin protocol. So just like uh, gold was scaled with paper money, right? Notes, promises to pay gold, mm-hmm. right? And just like Visa cards were scaling paper money and, and bank deposits, right? We are scaling Bitcoin. So lightning network 
is global instant final settlement private and and you know literally happens like that like anywhere in the world and this company strike is building a service whereby you can like pay any lightning invoice globally using your debit card um, so they assume some of sort of the risk and the operations on their side, but any, mm-hmm. this, this through strike, any American can use their debit card and it, on your bank statement, it helps privacy too. It just says strike. It doesn't say what you're doing with it. Um, it just says $25 to strike $50 to strike or whatever. So you can actually use your fiat money, which, which you may be, uh, more inclined to spend than your Bitcoin perhaps, um, yes. to pay any lightning invoice globally. Like instantly, this is pretty crazy. So there's like a lot of cool innovation happening here. And you can just think about it, what, what kind of impact that's going to have for folks around the world who, you know, ha- are trying to get little money from their friends or family or trying to earn some money or whatever. So I, I firmly believe that, that the Bitcoin lightning stack is going to have this is already having a tremendous impact and is going to have a bigger one on that whole world of unremittances and aid and, and sort of just like companies that have employees in different countries and jurisdictions. I mean, it's going to bring us a lot closer together. I mean, Bitcoin builds a lot of bridges and the world has a lot of walls and we need to take them down. This is really interesting. And there's, a, there's of course, other flip sides to this that we don't have time to discuss today, such as don't we also allow the freezing of bank accounts for a reason? But just to like very briefly address yeah. that, the, the issue is what we're trying to prevent is mass surveillance with a click of a button. That leads to authoritarianism, police states, and social engineering. We don't want that in America. And that proved to be ineffective. Ever since the Stone Revelations, we've seen just how brutally ineffective mass surveillance has been. It has trampled on the rights of Americans and yielded very little in terms of uh, policing, basically. Just very little little results, right? What we want is for our police officers and our law enforcement officials to go after bad guys – in a structure where there are courts, where they have to get warrants, where there's protections against citizens. Yeah, no, I really, I appreciate that distinction. So it's sort of in closing here, how can people donate Bitcoin to, let's say, Human Rights Foundation, your mm-hmm. organization? Uh, wh- and then also, where does it go? Because a lot of uh-huh. people might go, oh, I, you know, this Alex, the Alex guy was interesting, but like, I don't know if I want to give him 10 grand because he's probably just going to buy a, f- a fancy uh, bumper for his Maserati. <laughs> Well, we're a 501c3 and we're like, uh, you know, very closely audited. We're, we're a yeah. charity here in the United States. So um, if, if you want to, and I would encourage you to talk to the nonprofits you care about and, and mm-hmm. encourage them to accept Bitcoin. I mean, it's in America very favorable. It's treated like property. And when you make a Bitcoin donation, you get to take a write off at the value of that Bitcoin the day you make the donation. So let's say you got some Bitcoin five years ago. It's gone up in a huge way. This way you can do good in the world. You don't have to pay those capital gains taxes. It's very favorable. We'll provide you and your local charity, whoever you want to support, should, should provide you with a tax letter in return. What we're going to do with the Bitcoin um, depends on your intention. If you earmark it for something, like you want it to go to research, you want it to go to development, software development, you want it to help with our North Korea work, you want it to do something specific, you just would have to earmark that. If you don't, you know, we're going to we're gonna basically, you know, probably uh, hold on to that for a little while uh, as part of like an endowment strategy um, where we're going to basically, um, you know, continue to raise money in fiat uh, and dollars and, and spend that money on programs. Um, but any money that comes in in Bitcoin, we have more of a long-term strategy. I mean, we think that dictatorship is going to be around for many decades, unfortunately. <laughs> it's part of a uh, human condition in a way. Um, mm-hmm. So we want to build like a strong organization that's going to last into the future. And I think to do so, uh, we need to start sort of like thinking long-term about our financial position. So hopefully we can like keep some of the Bitcoin you donate to us as like a seed that will grow into a tree later and allow us to be a lot more powerful. So that's one thing that, that we're going to try to pledge to do and that I would encourage you all to, to talk to the charities and, and, you know, causes that you support and, and, and think about, you know, can they start accepting Bitcoin and how to do that? Um, so today you can donate at, you know, hrf.org slash BTC. Um, we hrf.org. And if you want to do other stuff, if you want to donate your time, if you want to donate ideas, please feel free to get in touch with me. I'm on Twitter at Gladstein, G-L-A-D-S-T-E-I-N. Alex, thank you so much. This is really, really fascinating. And there's a lot more that I think is, you, you do so much over there and 
Bitcoin's just the beginning, so I encourage people to go and take mm-hmm. a look at the website and just find out some of the projects. And, and I think this, these projects are just so interesting and probably very effective as well. I mean, n- not only do people need uh, money to live and run their operations, but when we're showing closed cultures that things outside are better and n- people aren't eating snow to survive, I mean, there's just so much – there, there's so much to be gained by unlocking the human potential of how many billion people was it? Four point something? Four point three. People? And um, I hope folks can, can join HRF and feel free to reach out to me to learn more. And thanks so much for having me.